Welcome to BCIS 1305. This is Dr. Schusler, and today we're going to talk about Chapter 8, Digital Storage. So we're going to talk about a lot of the different ways of storing things and places to store things and, and performance characteristics and all those types of things. So let's go ahead and dive on in and take a look at some of our, our different topics today. So we're going to differentiate between storage and memory. They're not the same thing. They both have information in there or data in there, and we're going to talk about the distinction between those two. We'll talk about the characteristics of internal hard drives and, and what are some of the things that, that make a hard drive a hard drive. We're going to talk about the uses of external hard drives and RAID. We're going to describe the benefits of solid state drives. We're going to differentiate among various types of memory cards and USB flash drives. We'll also discuss the benefits and uses of cloud storage. We're going to talk about and describe the characteristics of and differentiate among different types of optical disks, uh, um, disks that use light, CD-ROMs for example. Uh, we'll explain the types of enterprise storage and then we'll finish up talking about uh, magnetic stripe cards, smart cards, uh, RFID tags, etc. Okay, so in, in general what is storage? We started out the semester we talked about the IPO model, input, processing, and output. And that was a very early model when we were talking about information systems, but we've kind of evolved beyond just the, the, the basic IPO model to include communications and to include storage. In other words, we, we don't stop at just inputting data, processing it, and producing output. In some cases, we want to be able to share that output through a network or something like that, and that comes up later. Uh, in this chapter, we also want to talk about being able to store that information. We might want to be able to come back to it. The example we used in class is you may be working on a term paper. Rarely are you going to sit down in a single setting and uh, uh, single sitting and complete a term paper. Rather, you're going to work on it for a bit, save it, and come back to it later. So you want to be able to store that somewhere where you can come back to it later. Cloud storage is a form of storage. It'll, it, it, it's allowing us to store something out into the cloud. It's a situation in which we don't have to worry about how the data is actually being stored. But something I want you to keep in mind, there is a physical device somewhere that your files are being stored on. So it's, it's not some magical cloud that, that stores all your data and things like that. There's a server farm somewhere that is storing your, your data on a hard disk uh, or, or something similar just like you would in your, in your own personal computer. Okay, so a storage device is the hardware that records and or retrieves items to and from the storage media. If we're reading information or reading something from a storage device, we're pulling that information off of that storage medium and putting it into memory where we can work on it, where we can look at it and manipulate it. If we're writing it, we're taking it out of memory and transferring it to that storage medium. So we're writing the files, we're writing those ones and zeros to our storage medium. So what are some of the different options or different types of storage devices that are out there? Well, we've got the internal hard disk. If your internal hard disk looks like this, you've got a problem. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we, when we dive into hard disk in a little bit more detail here in a, here in a minute. We've got external hard disks, which are essentially the same exact thing. It's just packaged slightly differently. We've got solid state drives. We've got memory cards, USB flash drives, cloud storage, optical disks with a C rather than a K, network attached storage. Um, related to this are storage area networks, and we'll talk about both those when we get to enterprise storage. Magnetic stripe disk, smart cards, RFID tags, and something few of you have probably seen, microfilm and microfish. I think we had one person in class that had, had seen either one of those. Okay, so one of the ways, one of the things that we're going to do when we go to evaluate storage, our storage options, is we're going to look at the storage capacity. In other words, how much data, how much information can we store on a particular storage medium? Back in the olden days, you know, back in the in, in the 70s, uh, you, even the 80s, we were looking at kilobits. You know, how big is a file? And maybe a few k. Over time, our 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 concept of storage has grown significantly. So we've we've moved to megabytes and gigabytes. We see hard drives now in the in the terabytes. 
um, and, and it just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And don't ask me how to, to pronounce Zettabytes uh, and this one I have no idea. Yotabytes is, is, is my guess. But the idea is, is that it takes up more and more space because we're doing more and more with our computers. We're, we're manipulating videos. We're saving and watching movies from our computers. These are very, very, very large files, relatively speaking, to the text files in the, uh, that we used to use in the past. Uh, even our Word documents, because we include things like pictures and, and uh, uh, things like that, that it significantly increases the size of our files. So our need to be able to have larger and larger storage mediums uh, continues to increase. Something else we need to, to think about when we talk about storage is how are those ones and, and, and zeros represented on a hard disk and, and how is, is that information stored in terms of, of its permanence. And one way to look at this is, is to, to think about the volatility of that data. So if we, we talk about the volatility of the data, if we consider an on-off position, for example, in the on position, we're able to see our monitor. And consider for this example that we're using a desktop computer without a UPS. So there's no battery backup or anything like that. So we have our desktop computer. It's on. As long as we've got power, we can see what's on our display screen. Something we might have on that display screen, maybe something about tape, for example. Invisible tape, how much it costs per roll, how many rolls, and what's the total due. So that's in our memory. So we have information that's stored in memory. We also have information that's stored in non-volatile uh, storage, a hard disk, for example, in our example here, paper clips, glue stick, things like that. Now memory is said to be volatile and storage is said to be non-volatile. So if we lose power, if somebody flips the switch to the off position, if somebody kicks the cord, the power goes out, something like that, hard, hard, uh, uh, the power supply fails, we lose the information that's on our screen, right? The monitor goes blank, it goes out. The same thing happens to our volatile memory as well. The RAM goes blank, it loses any information that's, that's stored in it. Our non-volatile memory, however, our non-volatile storage, continues to have that same exact information. So when we power back on the computer, Anything that was on our in our storage is going to continue to be there. Whatever was in RAM or our volatile memory is gone. We're not, not going to get that back. So be sure you understand the, the distinction between volatile and non-volatile memory or storage. Another way that we, we uh, compare and contrast our storage options is the access time. In other words, how long does it take to be able to retrieve a file, to be able to, to work and manipulate with that file? Typically, this is going to be from fast to slow that we've got here. So to, right up here at the top, we've got the, our, our capability is fastest with memory. Memory operates very fast, very quickly. Unfortunately, it's volatile, so we, we run the risk of losing information if, if we lose power. Very close in terms of performance to memory are solid state drives. Solid state drives are very, very fast. There's no moving parts. Power consumption is less. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. Next to that, we have hard disks. Now, hard disks, we'll talk about a little bit more here in, here in just a minute as well, um, are, is a mechanical device. And so there's other problems associated with that. But there's also benefits in terms of very large storage, uh, relative cost, things of that nature. Then we've got USB flash drives and memory cards, which tend to operate pretty much the same. And then the slower end of the spectrum here, we have optical disks, which again use light to be able to, to uh, store and, and write data. Okay, so a hard disk. How does a hard disk work? Well, a hard disk it has one or more inflexible circular platters that use some sort of magnetic property to be able to store data. In other words, we, we use a charge to manipulate the, the um, magnetic characteristics on top of the platter to be able to represent ones and zeros. And hard disks come in different, what they refer to as uh, um, form factors. So for example, here we'll have a two and a half inch 
form factor hard drive which is used typically in a laptop. In some cases you'll see these for portable hard drives as well. Here we've got a three and a half inch form factor hard disk and that's normally what you're going to see in a desktop computer mounted in a, a hard drive bay. As I mentioned a moment ago, we'll use um, we'll, we'll use different charges to manipulate the the um, charges on different parts of the of the platter to be able to represent ones and zeros. So if you think about it in terms of of, of using those charges to manipulate the magnetic poles, we're creating ones and zeros depending on the polarity of that very small spot on the hard disk. So how are the how do we know where a file starts and where a file ends and things like that? Well, we break up the hard disk into different sections to be able to start files and, and fill up different parts of that hard disk. So in our particular example here, we, we look around and we've got different sectors of our hard disk. So we've got, if we count all the way around, we can see that we've got 18 different sectors. A track represents a concentric circle, so a circle that goes all the way around, continuous circle. So we'll look on the inside and we see that our um, our track on the inside is smaller than our track on the outside. And, and I want you to be aware of that. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to optical disks. And you'll be able to see a, a difference between the way that's handled for both of those. So basically what happens is <coughs> each one of these is uh, each one of these sectors is a different size depending on how far out we go. We also have clusters. So if we have a file that takes up more than one sector, it's going to move over into the next track and take up the rest of that space. So a cluster is a combination of more than one sector. So again, keep, keep all that in mind when we get to optical disks and there's, there's some slight differences when we get there. So what are some of those characteristics? Well, we just got through talking about tracks, talked about sectors, and there's platters as well. So when we talk about the platter, um, this is the platter itself. We can have one platter, we can have two platters, we can have three platters. The more platters that we have, the more surface space that we have to be able to store files onto that platter. We also have form factors. Remember we talked just a moment ago about two and a half inch drives, which is a form factor typically seen in laptops. We have a three and a half inch form factor typically seen in desktop computers. So that, that refers to the form factor, the size, the physical size, the way it's shaped. We have read and write heads, something that allows us to read and write data to those platters. And then we've got revolutions per minute. That platter spins around at a certain speed. Typical speeds are going to be 5400 RPMs or 7200 RPMs. And then in some cases with high performance disks, we'll have a 10,400 RPM disk. So this is what the inside of a hard disk might look like. Uh, I believe the next slide will tell you why this can't happen. Why we, if we see a hard disk in this shape, uh, it, it's trash or it's it's good for demonstration purposes only. It's no longer functional. But we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. Uh, here we basically see circuitry that is designed to control the function of the hard disk. In other words, it controls the spinning of the platters. It controls the read and write head that will move back and forth across the disk to be able to read and write data to that disk. And you're also going to see the different platters. So here on the top we've got one platter right here. We've got another platter right underneath it. And then we've got another platter right underneath that. So it looks like this disk has three platters in it. Something you can't see is that you've got a head right here. In all likelihood on the bottom side of this top platter you've got another head that is inverted, flipped 180 degrees, to be able to read the bottom side of this top platter. And then you've got another head that's on top of the platter that's in the middle, and then one that's on the bottom side of that platter in the middle. And then at the very bottom you've got a head that's on top of that bottom platter, and the same thing underneath as well. And again, this gives you more surface area to be able to increase your storage capacity. So the reason that that won't work if it's exposed like that is because the read and write head literally just kind of hovers right over the platter, barely off the platter. It can't physically touch it, 
because if it does, you have what's referred to as a head crash, and it will physically damage the disk, and you won't be able to read and write data from that, that portion of the disk anymore. It is so close to the head, the, the, the head is so close to the platter, you can literally see nothing, almost nothing will fit between it. Human hair, dust, smoke, nothing will really fit in between there. So it's very, very close. This is why you tend to see uh, hard disks for laptops fail much more often than you might see for a desktop computer because the, 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 the laptop gets banged around a little bit more and it, it doesn't take much to push that head into the platter and create a problem. Uh, so that, that's one of the issues with desktop computers. Also, because it's a mechanical device, remember we talked about this right here spinning around, this platter spinning around really, really fast, and this head moving back and forth spinning around right here. You've got opportunity for the bearings right here in this motor and the bearings right here in this motor wearing out. Because it's a mechanical device, they're going to wear out eventually. So it's not a question of if your hard disk is going to fail. It's going to fail. So always back up your data. Always keep your disk backed up. Something else to increase the performance of your hard disk is something referred to as disk cache. This is similar to the discussion we had when we talked about the CPU and, and level 1, level 2, level 3 cache. It's very high speed memory. It's a way to increase the performance of our hard disk. Essentially, when you go to retrieve files from your hard disk, rarely do you just retrieve one file from one individual sector and you're done. Usually, you're going to retrieve things that are all located in the same general area of the hard disk. Well, one of the things that your operating system can do is load stuff to the disk cache in anticipation that you're going to want some of that information that was around the file that you specifically requested. So it'll load that into cache, and now when you request it, instead of waiting for that platter to spin around and waiting for that head to move over to the piece of, or over to the sector that you need, it can simply load it directly from disk cache, and hence your experience, your performance is much better. The more cache you have, the faster your hard disk is going to be. The downside is the more expensive your hard disk is going to be. So it's a trade-off, cost versus performance. Another type of storage that, that uses hard disks, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail here in just a moment, is, is combining your hard disk in a RAID, um, some sort of a RAID configuration. Depending on the text that you read, RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent or Inexpensive Disks. And it's basically a way of combining two or more disks together to be able to provide some additional functionality. Uh, in some cases, they can provide instant backup. In other cases, they can provide, provide uh, performance increases. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in a, a few slides. In addition to our the storage devices that we've talked about before, those very same storage devices can be implemented as an external hard disk. So typically, those will be, these will be included in some sort of an enclosure, and they'll plug up directly to our systems via a USB port. And it's, it's a way to easily to, to create some additional storage very easily. Flash memory storage is a little bit different. There's no moving parts with flash memory storage, so that's a real benefit. And if we implement it as a solid state device, this gives us quite a few advantages over magnetic disks. Uh, they talk about higher storage capacities. You know, that it's possible cost-wise right now. It's not really feasible. Faster access times, faster transfer rates is absolutely true. Solid state drives perform very, very, very fast. Uh, really nice performance gains. gains. Uh, my son has a solid state drive in his laptop, and uh, he, he upgraded from a traditional hard, di hard drive uh, to the solid state drive, and the performance increase was significant. It was easy to, to spot the difference. Uh, quieter operation, because there's no moving parts, they're much quieter. There's not really uh, noise uh, generated by them. Can be more durable, again, because you don't have moving parts. There's, you don't run the risk of the head hitting the platter or anything like that. Lightweight, less power consumption, very desirable in, in mobile solutions, your laptops and, and tablets, things like that. Less heat generation. It also extends the battery life, again, of those, of those laptops and so on. So lots of pluses when we talk about those types of devices. 
As far as the memory inside of a solid state uh, device, it looks a lot like the chips that you might see on your uh, on your RAM. Some of those different form factors again, depending on how it's actually implemented. In a lot of cases, we want to make it look look and feel just like a traditional hard drive, whether it be the two and a half inch drive or the three and a half inch drive, because we want to be able to plug it up inside of our laptop. We want to be able to plug it up inside of our 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 desktop machine. That doesn't mean that we're limited to that form factor. We can have other form factors as well. And that's what you see in things like flash drives and, and so on. As far as flash memory storage, other types of, of, of uh, storage, memory cards, removable, removable flash memory device that you insert and remove from a slot in your computer, mobile device, card reader, etc. There's lots and lots of different formats. And in my opinion, that's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of them. Um, there's lots of different formats and you may or may not have the appropriate reader uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult to share files you know, w with your different devices or with different people um, so that's, that's one of the issues but there's lots and lots of different formats and they can be very convenient it's, it's a way to increase the storage of your, your tablets, of your smartphones um, printers, etc. so it, it, it can be very convenient This slide basically gives you an idea of how you might might go about using one with respect to the card reader, being notched, being able to write protect uh, your, your storage, uh, and, and stuff like that. Most of us are familiar with, with USB flash drives, and, and uh, there was a time certainly where these were very popular, I and they are still popular to a degree, but I think some of that popularity is starting to wane a little bit as we become more and more dependent on cloud storage, which will come up here in a little bit. Um, they're very convenient. They fit in your pocket. They, they can store quite a bit of data. The downside is, is they, they do fail. They do get lost. They do get washed in your pants and, and things like that. So that's one of the downsides to them, but they can be very, very, very con convenient. Uh, especially in certain situations. They don't cost a lot of money. In a lot of cases, you can go to various events and, and get them for free. Um, so um, it's certainly very convenient. Okay, so cloud storage. This is, is probably my favorite form of storage. I really like this. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, cloud storage does not mean that it, this is your storage is magically happen, happening out in the cloud and, and ones and zeros are being stored up in the cloud until you decide to download them. They're physically being stored on the types of devices that we just got through talking about. It's just you're not having to manage those devices. They're, those devices are being managed by Google or managed by Microsoft or, or some other party out on the Internet they have servers and hard drives that at server facilities that they're storing those files for you until you need them and then you retrieve them usually through your your web browser so cloud storage can be very convenient now the downside to it if you don't have good internet connectivity if you have slow internet connectivity this can be a real problem if you have spotty internet connectivity um, there may be periods of time when you can't access your file so that's something to be aware of um, but really our connectivity issues are, are really pretty solid today and so store, cloud storage can be a really good solution for, for many, many people. Now let's switch over instead of magnetic storage, magnetic uh, um, storage of information on media using, you know, representing different char uh, diff using different charges to represent ones and zeros, let's switch over to optical disks. And when we talk about optical disks, the spelling is slightly different. That's when we use a C as opposed to a K. So when we see disk spelled with a C, think optical disk. When you think optical, think light. It's some kind of light. It's usually going to be a laser. Um, so an optical disk consists of a flat, round, portable disk made of metal, plastic, or la and lacquer that is written and read by a laser. So how are the ones and zeros represented when we're dealing with light? Well, we can't really manipulate magnetically a, a, a disc the same way that we uh, 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 an optical disc the same way we do a hard disc the way we do it with a a, a um, an optical disc is we create pits in the disc itself and so the light laser will go through and strike the disc it's going to shine a light towards that disc 
if it strikes a pit, it's going to scatter. That laser's going to the beam of uh, uh, the laser beam is going to scatter. If light strikes a land, which is the flat part, it's reflected back towards the laser diode. Reflected light is deflected to a uh, light sensing diode, which sends a digital signal of one to the computer. So if it sees that, it sees a one. The absence of reflected light is read as a zero. So that's how it determines what represents a one versus what represents a zero. So pits and lands. Much like magnetic disks, optical disks have sectors. They have tracks, just like a, a, a magnetic disk. But not just like it. They're a little bit different. Rather than having tracks that are, represent one single circle, you're in, or I should say individual circles, when we talk about an optical disk, it has a single circle that just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a single track when we talk about optical disks. Also, the sectors are all the same length. So this length right here, the sector of that length, is the same as this one right here that looks like it's further, but in reality it's the same length as it is there. When we talk about optical disks, they're not all the same. There's several different kinds. Um, essentially, the two basic classes are CDs and DVDs. When we talk about CDs, we've got within that subset, we've got CD-ROMs, which are compact disc read-only memory. Those are the music CDs that you buy. Those are the, the software packages that you purchase off the shelf. And, and all you're going to be able to do with those is be able to read the information off of, off of them. You're not going to be able to write to them at all. A com compact disc read is a little bit misleading a little bit because it's, it's not just a case of being able to read. You can actually write to this disc. The problem is, is you can't write over and over and over again to that disc. Technically you can, but what you're doing each time you write to it, you're filling up that disc. And once that disc is full, you can't write to it anymore. It's full. You can't, can't write to it anymore. It's, it, it's done. A CD-RW, read-write, is one that you can. You can erase it, you can start over, you can rewrite, things like that. <coughs> so you can write multiple times to a CD-RW. A DVD-ROM is very similar to that CD-ROM. Digital video disc, read-only memory, high-capacity optical disc on which users can read but not write on or erase. Much higher storage capacity, usually about 4.7 gigabyte. Uh, so this makes it great for being able to share, uh, being able to to uh, view movies. Uh, so that's why you see DVDs um, uh, on on uh, DVD DVD movies on DVD ROMs. You've also got DVD Rs and plus and minus Rs. Uh, these are are different types of competing standards. Your optical drive may or may not read both kinds. Um, sometimes when you try a particular disk in one machine and won't read it, it may be because the uh, drive itself is a DVD-R and the disk that you're using is a plus uh, versus the drive is a minus. So that may be part of the reason. But DVD-Rs are write once, read many. So you can write to the disk and read many times. As opposed to the DVD-RWs, which has the same issue with respect to plus and minus, um, allows you to write and read many times. Now, enterprise storage <coughs> is a little bit different. At home, we don't tend to back up our data. I know we all talk about how important it is uh, to, to back up our data. I'm horrible about it myself. Um, we, we don't tend to do a very good job of backing up our data. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't make what we have a very good solution when we start talking about enterprise storage. If your boss doesn't back up a piece of data, and the hard drive fails, the, the, the boss is going to be mad at the IT people because it becomes the IT people's responsibility to safeguard their data. How are they going to do that? They're going to implement some sort of enterprise storage solution, and there's several different ways to do that. One is they can implement some sort of a RAID solution. Um, RAID's going to duplicate, uh, duplicate data in some way, shape, or form, there's different layers or dif different uh, um, di different layers of RAID. At its very most basic, RAID, RAID level one, 
uh, you are actually mirroring hard drives. And, and this is an approach I really like. Uh, <coughs> essentially what happens is when you write a file, it writes that file not to one disk, but to two disks at the same time. This gives you the benefit of having an instant backup. You've always got a backup. So even if hard, hard drive A fails right here, or this uh, disk fails right here, you still got your second disk that has all of your current information. Now that doesn't mean you don't still want to do backups because if you get a virus, that virus gets written to both disks. So you still want to have backups so that you can go back in time if you need to. And that's the idea behind an enterprise solution. Is it's it's going to you know be, it's intended for heavy use. Uh, it's intended to be very efficient, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And it's designed for maximum availability. So this addresses the availability part. It doesn't really address the efficiency part. And that's where striping comes in. Efficiency, we're talking about speed. How fast can it perform? And depending on the the level of grade that we have, we have striping. We have striping with parity and things like that. Parity allows us to have multiple hard disks and have a hard disk fail, and we can still continue to function. We can, re can replace that hard disk and not lose any data. Striping refers to our ability to write, read and write data across multiple disks at the same time. So let's say we have a, a, a particular file, and rather than writing that one file to a single hard disk, let's write half the file to the first disk, and the other half of the file to the second disk. Well, essentially that doubles the speed of our storage device. It has the file of the size of the file. So we're able to significantly increase our storage speed. Another enterprise option that we have is network attached storage. This is usually appropriate for individuals use or small businesses. It's, it's very convenient. I have a, a NAS device myself that I really like. Uh, it, it's essentially a device that will plug up to your network and it will be another host on the network. Uh, so it'll connect via a, a network connection. It's usually gonna be some sort of a hardware device. It can be a computer functioning as a NAS device, but it's, it's, it's often gonna be a, a, a hardware device that will allow you to plug in multiple hard drives into it. In a lot of cases you can mirror or stripe use some, some uh, different RAID levels on that particular device depending on what it supports. You will often log into it like you do your your uh, router via a uh, internet browser to be able to configure your network attached storage and it's very convenient. It allows access to various computers on your network to be able to access that shared storage medium. Uh, so it can be very con con convenient. Unfortunately, the performance of NAS devices is not extraordinarily good. It, it, it's really very good for most situations, but when you start getting into lots and lots and lots of users, the performance just isn't quite where it needs to be. And that's where a storage area network comes in. It's a a high-speed network with the sole purpose of providing storage to other attached servers. And the idea is it's, it's basically a secondary network. You've got your own storage network over here and your traditional network here. So whenever you have storage operations going on, you're not tying up your regular network with those storage, storage uh, operations going on. They're, they're done separately. And so when you have high performance situations, this is a good way to go. Now the downside to storage area networks, the cost is significantly greater than, than say a network attached storage solution. Another issue related to enterprise storage is the need to be able to back up our information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we typically don't like backing up our stuff. Corporations don't like backing up their stuff either, uh, but, but it becomes necessary. One of the ways you can help to uh, make sure that backups are occurring is you can automate the process as much as possible. And that's the example you see here in the here in the the, the image. You have a here you have a robot, a tape robot that goes around and will select the different tapes, store those tapes in the tape library. It can insert those tapes into the drive to be able to restore or or do backups, things like that. So you can automate a lot of this process. One of the real advantages to using tape is the cost is significantly less per megabyte on a, on a tape. And it allows you to, to store uh, uh, data that you need to be able to archive for long periods of time. 
Personally, I'm not a huge fan of this. I like network backups. I, <clears throat> I think the ability to automatically go off site with take back, or with uh, network backups is a, a, a big advantage. But there is still a large a lot, a lot of people that use tape backups, and there's still valid reasons for doing so. Other types of storage are credit cards, for example, have mag magnetic stripes on the back of them uh, and that contains small amounts of information. So there is data that's stored on those. Smart cards have integrated circuits embedded on the cards. Um, and again, so information is stored in those smart cards. RFID tags, we talked about this in a previous lecture um, a, as a replacement to barcodes, that RFID tags contain information. We retrieve those by uh, um, uh, addressing those through the antenna allows us to read the information off of those RFID tags. What kind of information is stored there? Product information, when it was run, things like that. An older type of storage is microfilm and microfiche. This is used a lot in libraries. Um, I asked in class if anybody had used um, any of this, and I only had one student raise their hand. I recall uh, um, several years back using these, and like I said, you see these a lot in libraries. They can store lots and lots of information on a relatively small amount of, of space. And they may take newspapers, for example, and have the individual pages on different parts of the film and when you put it into a microfiche or a microfilm reader light gets projected through it to be able to blow up the image to make it readable and, and be able to use it. Some of these high dollar microfiche readers, microfilm readers have the option to be able to print. The quality of these typically is not all that great but again it, it was a very good solution before uh, before we had computers and, and things like that. So in this chapter, we talked about some of the variety uh, of, of our different storage options. There's several different ones out there. For the most part, we're going to tend to probably focus on uh, two or three ourselves. So it's just it's what we typically do. We're, we may use we're, certainly we're going to use our hard disk, for example. We may use cloud storage. We may use thumb drives, but we're not going to use every one of these these different ones that we've discussed in most cases. Um, we talked about being able to evaluate different types of storage media's. Uh, mediums um, in terms of storage capacity, performance, things like that. We talked about some of the characteristics of hard disks. We talked about RAID and external di uh, drives. We talked about flash memory storage as well and, and what some of the issues were with that. We talked about advantages and various uses of cloud storage. Again, I'm a big proponent of cloud storage. I like it. I think it's, it's uh, certainly something that's going to, going to be a bigger and bigger part of what we do in information systems. We talked about optical disks and what some of the characteristics were, how they are similar to magnetic storage, but also how they're a little bit different too. And then we talked about enterprise storage options um, and, and some of the features of those. So that was that chapter in a nutshell. Um, I, I, it, it's a good chapter. There's some good information in here. Um, so go through the chapter, read the chapter, look at the PowerPoint. If you have any questions, by all means, shoot me a message. Um, but that's all I've got for you today.